Well, good morning, good morning, good morning from Massachusetts. I'm hoping that people will find time in their day to join me for the October live stream. And if you're watching the recording, thank you for taking time out of your day. I'm going to do a quick check of audio and video to make sure we're good to go. Yes, looks like we're good. Every so often I'm going to glance at my laptop to make sure what you're seeing and what you're hearing is all okay. As you join, feel free to say hi, join the chat. This is a public live stream so everyone can enjoy studying together. But if you'd like to participate in the live chat, you click join and you can become a member of my channel. There's a lot of fun perks you get for only a dollar a month. One of them is to join the live chat today. Day. I also invite members to send in questions before and during the live stream. And after the live stream today, my members will receive a follow-up task on the community tab. And those are just some of the perks that you can get. So if that sounds valuable and interesting to you, please click that join button and you can become a member of my channel. Hey there, Stunning Lad One. Good morning to you. Okay, looks like we're good to go. We have about 30 to 60 minutes. I always promise 30. I usually push to 60 because I find there's so much that I want to share with you all. And usually we have good participation from the members. So hopefully we'll have at least a good 30 to 60 minutes together today. Hope you're doing well. Say hi. Tell me where you are um, watching from. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are. And also if you're watching the recording, what time of day it is for you. Thank you again for taking the time to join me. Um, as usual, you can post questions in the chat. I'll try to keep up with them. If I miss them, then you'll have to post them again and catch my attention later in the live stream. But I'll give um, an opportunity to ask some questions. There are some that I've already noted and I've prepared prepared some tasks based on those questions, okay? All righty. Well, it's a beautiful, sort of a beautiful morning. Any morning can be beautiful if you have a good mood, right? It started out a little cloudy, but just as I was walking, um, I looked up at the sky and I saw a little parting of the clouds and um, some of the blue. And that's a promise because it seems that we're going to have more of a blue sky in the second half of today. But um, we've had some warm weather here in Massachusetts this past week, but I think the cold weather is coming back. I wonder where you are and what kind of weather you're having and if it's a beautiful day for you as well. Hey, Spanish with Deborah joined as well. Glad to have you and thank you for joining me over here, Deborah. I know you came over from Instagram the other day. So guys, do follow me um, on different platforms because I offer different types of videos and different live events. We just had a live on Instagram. If you missed it, you can watch that recording. And Deborah was one of my courageous um, volunteers to hop on and we read some poetry together. So if you're curious about that practice session, go over to Instagram and you can watch that recording okay all right let me work my magic and see if I can get the screen showing let's see can you see what I see I'm gonna take a look at my laptop to make sure that you can see my screen right now <laughs> stunning lad one flexing your language skills. Uh, something I just posted last week was um, my follow-up lesson on foreign words in English. I shared eight more foreign words, and I'm starting to share some of the excerpts on Instagram. The first one had me um, saying a few different greetings in different languages, and I wanted to challenge people and ask, how many ways can you say hello um, and how are you? Uh, you don't have to be fluent necessarily in all of those languages. Languages, but it's nice to know how to greet people um, in different languages. So if you have a moment and you'd like to tell me how many ways can you say hello, like how many languages um, do you know to, just to say hello? Um, can you say it in French and Spanish, you know, in Japanese? How many different ways can you say hello? I'm curious. Feel free to answer that question. Um. <laughs> 
Yes, Stunning Lad One, you're also on Patreon, which is another place to follow me. So as I said, guys, this is a member um, only, it's a member only live chat. So if you want to participate with Stunning Lad One and Spanish with Deborah, feel free to click the join button and you'll participate as well. They're also going to receive a follow up task on the community tab once this live stream is over. So it's a great deal for only $1 a month. It's also a way to support my channel. So thank you, thank you to all my current members. If you really want to go beyond um, that and have interaction with your video on, your camera on, your mic on, then Patreon is where you wanna be. Advanced learners are invited to join me on Patreon as lifelong learners. These are people who've, a lot of them have been with me for months, maybe even over a year or more, because we have ongoing learning together. They're teaching me just as much as I'm teaching them. We have live classes to a month. Each class is 75 minutes. We have about 60 minutes of study, 15 minutes for Q&A. If there's not Q&A, then we just go into more conversation and practice. This month, our live classes are on October 13th and 27th. I usually have a morning and an afternoon class, Boston time, so that people from different time zones can join in. You get pre and post lesson tasks, exclusive materials. As soon as you sign up, you have access to all previous recordings. There's a lot there because I've been on Patreon for a few years now. You also get some private messaging with me and we focus on all skills. So if that sounds like something that you could benefit from and I think a lot of you could then um, check out patreon read the perks and click if you really want to make that commitment starting in October okay <laughs> goodness I hope you don't hear the noise out there I'm wondering what is that outside my window I don't know lately they've been doing tree cutting can you imagine here in Massachusetts where I live we have lots of tall trees and so these companies come around hired usually by the towns or by private residents and they cut big trees down before the winter comes um, so that tree branches don't fall on houses and roads and lines so every so often I wake up and I hear the tree cutters um, it sounds like they're, they're pretty close today I hope that you don't hear the buzzing outside my window <laughs> okay Let's get into the first task that I've prepared for you. I want to talk about, um, for not too long, but enough time to um, get some quality practice in. We're going to focus on pronunciation of contractions so that you can sound more natural when you say them. Okay, there's lots of different contractions. The ones we're going to focus on initially, let me get my screen going. Oops, a little bit there. Is that good? I know some of you are on phones, so it may be harder to see. Maybe I'll go like this, and then I'll go bigger, and we'll see if that helps, because some of you are on a small screen. <laughs> How's that? Yes, I see someone's mentioning Arabic, stunning lad one. I should, um, I should learn how to say hello in Arabic. <laughs> I'll have to go on YouTube later and watch a tutorial on how to say hello in Arabic. <gasps> okay. Task A, contractions with am and are. Words can be stressed or unstressed in English, right? Not every single word is stressed. If all words were stressed, we'd speak like this. <laughs> we'd be emphasizing every single word. But as you know, um, we don't stress um, every single word. We stress content words, words that carry meaning. Now, when we do contractions, we're combining a verb and the pronoun. So I am becomes I'm. You are becomes your. We are we're, they are there. What you just heard me say are the very full and careful pronunciations of these contractions. So when we're stressing these words, we stress the vowel sounds. And so, oops, we lengthen the vowel sounds. And so, for example, we might do this when we need to clarify, who is the leader? Why are you looking at me? I'm not the leader, you're the leader. And that kind of statement, I'm stressing these contractions. The vowel sounds are very full and carefully pronounced. I'm. I'm not the leader. You're the leader. Right? Let's get that straight. Okay? So, again, moving into this kind of statement, making a clarification. Who's responsible for that task? We're not responsible for that. They're responsible for that. We're there. 
very full sounds. But a lot of the time what you're going to hear when people speak fast, the American um, English speakers can speak quite fast and relaxed. The pronunciation is left care less careful and so these contractions become unstressed. Instead of I'm, you're going to hear um, um. Okay, a lot of uh, full vowel sounds when unstressed sound like a schwa. Um, um, I'm going. Not only will you hear um, a reduction with I'm, going can sound like going, right? Almost as if somebody dropped the G. So you'll hear some variation with that. But focus on changing I'm to um. Again, you're going to do this in fast, relaxed speech. You wouldn't do this at a very slow rate of speech. You would do it in fast, relaxed speech. I'm going. Yeah, I'm going. Are you going? I'm going. I'm going tonight. Um, I'm going. You're going, right? Instead of your, it can reduce to your. You're going, right? Yeah, I'm going. You're going? I'm going. <laughs> um, your. Do you hear the difference? Instead of I'm, um, I'm going, I'm going, I'll see you there. Your reduces to your, your. You're going, right? Yeah, I'm going. Okay. I'm, um, your, your. Instead of we're going, oh, we're, we're, we're. Sounds like we're, we're. We're going. Are you going? Yeah, we're going. We'll see you there. Instead of there, sounds like there. They're, they're going, we're going and they're going, so we'll all be there. In fast, relaxed speech, it can be hard to catch all of these sounds and understand all of the words because things are fast and vowel sounds are reduced. So you need to train your ear to understand both. It's easier to understand stressed forms because they're nice and clear, vowel sounds are lengthened. But in fast, relaxed speech, you're going to hear reduction. Vowel sounds get reduced. You do not hear full sounds. Often things are reduced to schwas. In this case, you're going to hear er, not your, your, not we're, were, not there, there. Again, listen, I'm going, you're going, we're going, they're going. Okay. So train your ear to hear that. You can also practice, but again, if you really need to be understood, it's better to go slower and speak more carefully. But if you're practicing, you're shadowing somebody because um, you're watching a movie or a TV show clip on YouTube and you want to shadow the actors, they're going to do reduction. They're not going to use the full stressed forms unless they're clarifying and emphasizing as we saw up there. Okay? Yes. And reduction happens with going to when we get gonna. And I'm glad you brought that up. Be careful with those forms like gonna and wanna. Um, you can say them, I say them, but I don't encourage you to use them. It's funny when you're texting, if you've ever used the dictation tool and you um, start dictating, when I say gonna and wanna, that's exactly what my phone writes. And I go in there and I change it because I don't like seeing those written forms. I would prefer to see going to written even if I say gonna. And I would prefer to see want to rather than wanna. <laughs> okay. All right. So remember, we have reduction with am and r. Am and r. Train your ears to hear them. Okay. Also, another tricky um, contraction or a pattern in contractions are contractions that use a glottal stop. This is typical of American English. So glottal stops. Um, it's a tricky sound to make. It's more important to understand than to produce it. But if you're trying to aim for more natural um, English, especially if you're going for that American English or Canadian English accent, you'll want to work on your glottal stop. It's that sound that you hear when we say, uh-oh, or uh-uh. If you hold your breath with your mouth open, because if you hold your breath with your lips closed, your lips are doing the work like that. But if you hold your breath with your mouth open, the only thing that's going to help you hold your breath is this thing in the back of your throat called this glottis. So if you're holding your breath with your mouth open, you feel this closure in your throat, right? That's what you're using to make a glottal stop. So we are not dropping a T sound. We're using a glottal stop to stop the sound. So cannot becomes 
can't. In careful speech, I would say the T, and you might hear that little puff of air at the end, just a little, can't. But in everyday conversational English, I would use a glottal stop, can't. Different from the affirmative can, and I hold out that N, can't. I cut off the sound here. So all of these contractions in bold use a glottal stop. It's that NT at the end of a at the end of a sentence, the end of a phrase, or it could be before a word that starts with a consonant sound like S, N, F, or the R sound. So when you have the NT at the end, at when you're going to pause, or before a consonant sound, we use the glottal stop very often. Okay? So again, hold your breath um, with your mouth open and have awareness of what you're using and where that closure is happening. That's one way to do it. Or practice saying like, uh-oh, or uh-uh, uh-uh. If you can make those sounds, you're producing the glottal stop. Okay. Hey, my pit bow is here. Good to have you here. Okay. All right. Let me take a sip of tea and we're going to go through the contractions with the glottal stop. Okay. You can repeat after me and you see over here, this is the full form. I'll be pronouncing the words in bold. Repeat after me. Can't. Don't. Isn't. Aren't. Wasn't. Weren't. Won't. Couldn't. Wouldn't. Shouldn't. Mustn't. And I'm going to put a little asterisk there because we don't use that form too often. Won't. Hasn't. Haven't. Hadn't. Okay, I'm not dropping the T, I'm replacing it with a glottal stop. There's a different. I'm not saying hadn't, I'm saying hadn't, hadn't, okay? It's easier to say these, I think, in a short sentence, so that's what we're going to do next. You can repeat after me, remembering that we'll have a glottal stop before the main verb, right? I can't stay. I don't know. Now, I'll emphasize here that casually, you could say, I don't know. And you might hear people um, say that. They possibly could write it, but it's in the category of one and gonna. I don't encourage you to use that kind of spelling. Don't know, but it's possible. Okay. Um, so fast and relaxed, I don't know. But if you need to emphasize the contraction, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know, so stop asking me. <laughs> it isn't fair. You aren't wrong. I wasn't home. We weren't home. We won't be home. I couldn't go. He wouldn't go. We shouldn't go. We mustn't do that. And again, this is less common. She hasn't said anything. They haven't said anything. It hadn't been long. Yeah, and I see Stunning Lad writing, it could sound like mustn't, but again, I'm not dropping the T. I'm not saying mustn't. I'm saying mustn't, mustn't. There's a, you cut it off. You cut off the sound. Um, so it's not a, re, it's, it's a replacement, but I'm not omitting the T. I'm substituting a glottal stop there, okay? So that's a taste of the kind of practice you can do. Where can you get that practice? I have an audio recording of these tasks and other tasks where I go through all the contractions, even ones like aisle and sheed and he's. So I have a nice package of um, a PDF and audio 
Um, so there's a PDF and MP3. These are packages that you can download on my Shopify store. Let me see if I can actually give you a glimpse of what it looks like. If I hop over here, by the way, so if you're outside the US, you can click on store and you'll see it here on YouTube. But um, if you're not, in the U if you're in the US, you may not see the store, just come down to my links and you can click on digital products and it'll take you over to this store. Okay, so once you click over, come and you'll see what I have available at the moment. Um, so some of the tasks that you just saw came from this package, Contractions in American English. There's an audio and a PDF. Find out what exactly you get. Okay, we go over different sets of contractions. Um, it's about almost 12 minute recording and a six page PDF. So you could use that for self practice and um, you can practice independently. Okay. All right, let's head back over here. And I have something fun for you to try. <laughs> I always like to put the sounds in a meaningful context. And um, you know, lately, I've been having a lot of fun with chat especially with poetry and um, I decided to ask ChatGPT to give me a limerick with some contractions. Um, I liked mostly what it came up with but I had to change it here and there so it's not exactly what ChatGPT um, came up with. I, I had to tweak it. I had to edit it a little bit. Um, I just asked for a humorous limerick. Limericks are funny little poems. They're often like a story but a story told in rhyme and as you can see one, two, three, three, four, five lines. That's a typical um, length of a limerick. And this is the pattern. You see wouldn't, couldn't, shouldn't. So the rhyme pattern is A, A, B, B, A. So that's what makes a limerick. And there are all kinds of limericks. There's um, funny ones for children. There's funny ones for adults. <laughs> and um, you can make up your own once you get the pattern. It's kind of funny. Okay. All right, let's have a little fun reading this one. There once was a chef who wouldn't reveal why his soup just couldn't taste like it really should, but he said, it's all good. Ask for my secrets. You shouldn't. <laughs> okay. Again, practice before we go into this, the three contractions, wouldn't, couldn't, shouldn't. And I just said those with glottal stops. Okay. Um, vocabulary, I think you should know everything. Here's the chef. Reveal is to show, right? If you're not revealing it, you're keeping it a secret. So he wouldn't reveal, he wouldn't tell, he wouldn't show, he wouldn't share why his soup couldn't taste like it really should. He said, it's all good. Ask for my secrets. You shouldn't. We're breaking um, the usual word order here, but you can do that in poetry. You shouldn't ask for my secrets is what he's saying. Again, let's do it line by line. You can repeat after me. Try to produce that glottal stop at the end of each line here. And one, two, and five. There once was a chef who wouldn't. Reveal why his soup just couldn't. Taste like it really should. But he said it's all good. Ask for my secrets. You shouldn't. Okay, just something for fun. If you'd like to play around with limericks, um, I also asked ChatGPT to come up with some other ones. Again, what, the, what ChatGPT produced was pretty good, but I had to do some tweaking. And what I did here um, is I shared limericks with a missing fifth line. So you see the rhyme patterns are set up in a similar way. We have one, two, three, four, line five is missing. You see A, A, B, B. So the last line needs to end with E to rhyme with key and glee. In limerick two, we have astute, resolute, day, way. So this last line needs to rhyme with oot astute, resolute, 
right? Why poetry? Um, I've said this before. It's fun. It's meaningful. It helps build that sense of rhythm, encourages linking. So it inclu- it helps you build that smooth, um, connected speech that many of you are striving to attain, right? So it promotes that kind of fluid speech, builds confidence. Um, if you're learning vocabulary, it becomes memorable. So for some of you, you might be, hmm, glee's a new word. Students learned English with glee. Ooh, with glee. Glee is a synonym for happiness, delight, and joy. Glee. So you might think, oh, I just learned a new word. And it's easier to remember because you're learning it in the context of a limerick, right? Do you want to learn with glee, learn with delight, learn with joy? Okay. Um, Two other words that might be new for you are astute and resolute. Jennifer's students were so astute. Right? Of course, you guys are so smart, so sharp, and so clever. Astute is another word for being like mentally sharp. You're very clever, astute. And to learn English, they were resolute. Perhaps you know resolutions, like New Year's resolutions, when you're determined to make a change. You're de- determined to establish a good habit for the new year, right? Resolute um, is determined right? So you're determined to learn English. (laughs) So limerick, fun little poems. Um, Also, why I think it's fun to do something like this is that you probably have learned over the years that if there's anything that you're trying to master, when you can start having fun with it, that shows a level of confidence and a level of mastery. Um, Think of like athletes that play around, you know, there's things that you do during a game to win, but there's also kind of skills that you do just for fun. Maybe not showing off, but you just play around like soccer players, like how many bounces can they do with the ball with their head their knees their feet and can they do it 20 times 50 times and just for fun you don't do it that much in a game but playing around shows confidence and skill so similarly have fun with with english play around in different ways like creating stories or um, writing limericks you want to play with the language because you're also building awareness of Rhyme. If you can rhyme, you have a sense of the vowel sounds, key, glee. What other words do you know with E? Okay, so I'm going to read these limericks. If there are any suggestions now, I'll look for them. <laughs> okay, again, these limericks have should have five lines, and these li- two at the bottom, we're missing the fifth line. So the challenge now is whether or not you can produce that fifth line. I'll also allow my members um, after the live stream to ponder a little bit and think what might work. How could we end these limericks? So that will be one of the follow-up tasks. Um, If you want to play around with these limericks and finish them, that would be fun. And then I encourage you to actually read them aloud, record yourself and practice. Okay, here's limerick number one. In live streams that were so key, students learned English with glee. Using verbs, nouns, and phrases, they navigated mazes. (laughs) And you also want to get roughly the same number of syllables in live streams that were so key. Students learned English with glee. So seven, seven. So you're going to try to produce seven syllables. If you can um, count syllables and rhyme, (laughs) you have a pretty good set of um, skills to start writing poetry. Okay. So that's limerick one. Limerick two, Jennifer's students were so astute. To learn English, they were resolute. They'd practice each day in a fun, interactive way. (laughs) Jennifer's students were so astute. Well, that's nine. To learn English, they were resolute. Nine. So you're aiming for around nine in that last line. Oh, there was, there's our first one. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, Deborah. Okay, so we'll be getting into um, some um, grammar in a bit, Deborah, so you can come back and watch the recording at the halfway point. Thank you for joining. Okay. So we have our first suggestion here. In live streams that were so key, students learned English with glee. Using verbs, nouns, and phrases, they navigated mazes, which was lots of fun for me. 
which was lots of fun for me. Oh, excellent. Seven syllables and we got a rhyme, <laughs> right? So key here, we're using it so important. When things are key, they're important, they're significant. Um, so the key points are main points, important points. Glee, happiness, joy, delight. Okay, I like that one. I'm going to put that one in, which was lots of fun for me. I like that. Oops, which was lots of fun for me. If you have your own suggestion of how, for how to end that, you can put that there. Okay. <laughs> All right. Oh, it was, it was really a hoot. Hoot works. It was really a hoot. Okay, we need to add, it was a total complete hoot. Oh, we have to keep, it was such a total hoot. I'm still at seven. You need to add some more syllables to get up to like a nine. It was really, I have to say it was such a hoot. Okay, to learn English, or I have to say it was such a hoot. How about that? I have to say it was such a hoot. I have to say it was such a hoot. Counting syllables is a, another um, skill. It trains your ears. Uh, can you hear syllables in English, right? You need to know, um, have awareness of syllables because we have stressed syllables and unstressed syllables. As I'm counting, you're hearing me speak almost robotically because I'm emphasizing each and every syllable. I have to say it was such a hoot. But when I'm actually reading the poem, I'm going to stress my content words, nouns, verbs, adjectives, and adverbs. I have to say it was such a hoot. Um, the verb to be is often uh, considered a function word. I have to say it was such a hoot. Bum, 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 bum. Limericks or poems, poems promote rhythm. Rhythm is part of the English language. So you want to master the rhythm right? And that has to do with stress. Jennifer's students were so astute. To learn English, they were resolute. They'd practice each day in a fun, intera interactive way. I have to say it was such a hoot. <laughs> and you heard me hesitate because I was debating which way to read it. We could say interactive, but I can also drop that T. Americans often do that, as you know, for internet instead of internet, international instead of international, interactive instead of interactive. So it depends how careful you want to read in a fun, interactive way, in a fun, interactive way you can choose okay <laughs> it was really a hoot that sounds better to me are you rhyming or commenting to earn these they were so resolute it was really a hoot to learn how to they were so resolute it was really a hoot I'm tempted to leave it like this just to balance it because this is the length of lines one and two but of course you could simply do you, you could simply cut it off like that. They'd practice each day in a fun, inter interactive way. It was such a hoot. I prefer having the length, but hey, in poems, you are the poet, you write the poem how you want. <laughs> okay. All right. So we practice contractions, especially with that glottal stop. We learned what limericks are and how you can play around with them and why you would take the time to play around with something like a limerick to increase your mastery. Mastery of what? Pronunciation, awareness of syllables, rhythm, linking, rhyme. There's a lot that goes on when you play around with poems or limericks. Okay. All right. Let's scroll down. Um, we have a few questions. One of them came from a viewer. This was interesting because I want to make sure everyone remembers how we use nationalities. Um, if there are more questions, by the way, feel free to post them. Um, somebody asked recently, which is correct? Do we say they are Canadian? They are Canadians. I think that was the question I got, right? Do you know the answer? <laughs> Oh, I see a variation. I like that. Boot is a good word. To boot, if anyone is not familiar with that expression, to boot is like extra, something extra. OK. 
Okay. Okay. Remember with nationalities, we have nouns and we have adjectives. If we say they are Canadian, I'm using the adjective, right? They're not American, they're Canadian. They're not Japanese, they're um, Canadian, for example. Um, Canadians, here I'm using a noun, a plural noun, right? People, Canadian, Canadians. So if you add an S, you just formed a plural noun. If you use it without an S, you're identifying their nationality and you're using their adjective. A lot of nationalities end like this, American, Mexican, Canadian, Brazilian. So those kinds of nationalities have the two forms, the adjective and the noun. So just be careful. Um, so for example, um, oops, come down here. They are Mexican. They are Mexicans. I think it sounds more natural to say they are Mexican um, or I met a group of Mexicans. Now that sounds a little more natural, okay? They are Canadian. Um, I saw uh, a group of Canadians, right? Now we have of and we know that after a preposition we need an object, a noun. So I'm going to use the plural noun form, okay? A-N-S. ANS. Okay, be careful with that. Um, there are other forms that are more difficult. You can always use dictionaries to help. Okay, so for example, um, what if I said they are Japanese? I met a group of what? <laughs> This is where it gets a little tricky because we don't do Japaneses, right? We don't add an S to make them plural. I would probably stick with the adjective. It sounds more natural to me. You can say Japanese because that's the form, right? Uh, but I would say maybe Japanese, what? Tourists, um, scientists, something like that. So I'd probably still use the adjective and then specify further who exactly they are. Students, tourists, scientists, what? But technically, Japanese is also um, a noun. In fact, a lot of them this way that end with this ending, we use the, for example, um, the Japanese. Now I'm making a generic reference to the whole group. The Japanese are um, very... Something like this. The Japanese are very respectful of tradition. Something like that. Now I'm referring to the whole group. Um, we can't say the, we'd say Americans would be the general reference. Americans are this way, Japanese are that way. The Japanese, that whole nation, that whole culture. Okay. So um, I would encourage you to go to good resources so that you can confirm adjectives and nouns. Um, I might do a follow up practice for the members just to give you a little test. Let me see if I can actually test you right now. I'm going to read out a couple um, of countries and then you can tell me what the form is. Okay. I'm looking, by the way, I got out one of the grammar books from my bookshelf. This is a book that um, I wrote with my colleague, and we have um, a chart in the back of our book um, for all the different nationalities. It's a very long list. It goes on to a second page. Um, let's do, whoopsies, Belgium. Who lives in Belgium? Let me do another one. Um, <laughs> Who lives in Morocco? And who lives in Poland? I'll pause there. Okay. When in doubt and you can't remember the exact form, just you could always say people from Belgium, people from Morocco, people from Poland. If you can't remember the forms and you don't have easy access to a dictionary, just work with the language that you do have. British. Yes, that's a good one. Mm -hmm. The British Brits. Although I, um, with British, I also wonder, would you accept Britain? Like B-R-I-T-O-N. Very good. I see the first form there. Belgian, right? They are Belgian. There was a group of Belgians.
<laughs> How about Morocco? Yeah, just confirming. Always look at different dictionaries. And when you're really in doubt, check more than one because not all dictionaries agree on um, on everything. <laughs> so one of the ones that I have on my phone, now on my computer, I have a lot of learner's dictionaries bookmarked. I like Longman, I like Merriam-Webster, Collins, Cambridge. There's a number of dictionaries I have bookmarked. On my phone, I usually go to Merriam-Webster um, and they're just confirming that, that Japanese is a noun and the plural Japanese, right? The language of the Japanese, but we often use the article the to refer to the group collectively. Yes, Moroccans. Okay. Right, you could talk about Moroccan products if they're imported to your country, Moroccan exports, but the Moroccans, the people of Morocco. And how about Poland? And again, I'm just going to confirm if dictionaries agree with me. Oops. Oh, isn't it funny? They don't recognize. Mm hmm. Poland is tricky. Yes, very good. So um, if you talk about music, Polish music, Polish, the Polish culture. Um, you could say the Polish. I believe that would be possible. The Polish. There's another form. I don't see it used as much, but Poles is also listed in the dictionary, right? right the language of the Polish, the language of the Poles, the Polish language. Again, when in doubt, check a dictionary, but you can always find a workaround. You can always find a way to avoid forms that you're doubtful of until you can actually confirm it. So you could always talk about people from Canada, people from Mexico, people from Japan, people from Belgium, people from Morocco, and people from Poland, or the language they speak in Morocco, if you don't know. What do Moroccans speak? If you don't remember Moroccan, you can say, what language is spoken in Morocco. Just form the question with the country name. Okay. All right. Oh, Croatian. Yep. So I'll give you a little quiz. Members can find that in the follow up task. Okay, let's push on. Um, this is another interesting question that came up from a viewer this past week um, about the word most. I think it's actually most interesting. I might actually create a video about this in the future because I, there, are quite a, there are quite a number of ways we use this word. And the viewer was asking about the grammar of this word, the part of speech. Is it a pronoun? Can it be a pronoun? Yes, but not always. So I wrote a few sentences here for us to look at in identify how the word most is functioning. Let's take a look. Okay. The most beautiful time of the year is fall. And I actually want you to see it more like this together. Okay. Is it a pronoun here? No. Here's the word beautiful and we're modifying beautiful. Beautiful is an adjective. What modifies adjectives? Adverbs. Okay. So here it's an adverb. We're going to put it like this. If this is here, this is an adverb. How beautiful? More beautiful, the most beautiful. Okay. Most people think fall is a beautiful season. Most people think fall is a beautiful season. People is a noun. What goes before nouns. Well, adjectives, possibly, but also determiners and quantifiers. Which people? Most people. Many people. Some people. Few people. Most people refers to the majority. So I'd identify this as a determiner or a quantifier, right? Um, some dictionaries might even say it's an adjective. 
I think we're talking about quantity. So let's call that a, deter a determiner. I think that's determiner or quantifier. I'll be more specific and say quantifier, which is a type of determiner. Right? Which people the majority. Compare this. Most people, there's my subject, here's my verb. Most people think. I could also say most think fall is a beautiful season, but my sister loves spring more. Focus on this first clause, okay, here, all right, most think, what we're really saying is, just so you know the grammar here, that, but I dropped that, okay, so subject verb, most think, put this up here, what's happening is I dropped people and this became my subject. So is it a pronoun? Yes, most. Now you need to understand the context. I'm talking about people in general. Most think fall is beautiful, but my sister's different from the, the majority. She loves spring more. So here, yes, it's a pronoun because I'm, I'm substituting a noun. I see that as a pronoun. Out of all the seasons, I love fall the most. Um, no, I, I see determiners are quantifiers. Those are together. Quantifiers are like in the category of determiners. That's how I see it. We put it before a noun to determine specifically who or what we're talking about. Adverbs modify adjectives, other adverbs, and... Um, verbs, right? So this one, adverb, modifying beautiful. Most people is a determiner, which people or quantifier. It's in front of people. This is a pronoun because that's my subject. Who thinks fall is beautiful? Most think fall is beautiful. Here, out of all the seasons, I love fall the most. I see that as an adverb. I love fall more. I love it the most. I love it a lot. We're describing how much do you love it. I see that as an adverb. I love fall the most. The most you can hope for in October is a handful of warm days, right? Don't expect lots of warm weather in October. The most, the very most you can hope for in October is a handful of warm days. Okay. What can you hope for? You can hope for this. You can hope for that. You can hope for the most. I see that possibly as a pronoun or if you want to see it as a noun phrase. I was digging around. I hopped from dictionary to dictionary and I saw one dictionary list this phrase um, under the entries of noun, like a noun phrase. I saw another dictionary listed under pronoun. At this point, I don't really care so much about that label. Nouns and pronouns basically have the same functions, right? They can be um, subjects and they can be objects. So the most you can hope for. I was initially saying it, it's a pronoun, but if you don't like the idea, the viewer was saying, well, how can we have the <laughs> um, before a pronoun? Remember that when we talk about categories of words, it's not always a single word. So for example, um, pronouns. We usually think of pronouns as she, he, I, it, ourselves, himself, single words. But pronouns could be um, a two-word unit. For example, each other, one another, right? Same thing with prepositions. We usually think of prepositions as single words like in, at, on, between, among. But there are some prepositions that are multi-word phrases, but they, are, they function together as one unit as a preposition, as opposed to, in spite of. They're multi-word prepositions. So could it be that perhaps we have a multi-word pronoun? Um, so I don't care if you call it a pronoun or a noun. You need to recognize, though, it's functioning as an object. You can hope for what? The most. So you can debate it with me if you want. Noun, pronoun, I don't care what you really call it. Dictionaries don't seem to agree. You can check Longman, you can check um, Merriam-Webster, and I see that they don't actually agree with their labels either. <laughs> but I, I was ready to label it as a pronoun.
um, the most. But again, one dictionary disagreed and said, no, that's a noun phrase. I'm like, okay. Right. right, many think that fall, most think. And if you use many, you're also using a pronoun, right? Which people? Many people, many. So is most a pronoun? Yes, it can be, but not always. This most definitely here is an example of most serving or functioning as a pronoun. This is the clearest example to me. This one is an example that could be argued, <laughs> could be debated, noun or pronoun, simply because we have the in front of it. So if you want to say, no, 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 that's, that's probably a noun phrase. Okay, that's fine. All right. But pay attention to the ways we use this word. There's a number of ways we use most. Interesting, right? Okay. Um, we're going to wind down with a look at prepositions. Um, this came from one of our members who loves grammar, from, of, by, to. But there are a number of other prepositions we can confuse these prepositions with. So when we're learning prepositions, um, you want to understand the meanings, learn collocations, and practice the collocations. Okay, so from generally is this direction, like an origin, like I'm coming from Boston to Pittsburgh. From Boston, Boston is the origin. Or if something is coming from the heart, that's the source, that's the origin. From is like the source, the starting point. Of often shows belonging. She's one of us. He's one of them right? Belonging or showing that it's a part of a group. Of often shows belonging. By can be creation um, or an instrument like by means of, or often we use it in the passive with that by phrase written by Shakespeare, produced by Steven Spielberg, by. Two can often show direction like from Boston to Pittsburgh, or if I'm giving a gift to um, Mahippo there in Japan, it's coming from me and I'm giving it to her. So she is the recipient. So in general, prepositions have a meaning. Um, you want to learn collocations, the combinations of prepositions with nouns, with verbs, with adjectives. These are not phrasal verbs. Phrasal verbs are special, like look forward to something. You have to learn phrasal verbs as a unit right? Like the prices are going up. Um, that simply means the prices are increasing. So phrasal verbs have a verb and one or two particles. They all function as a unit and the particles extend or change the meaning of the verb. But when we have prepositions, we're simply adding information, maybe who's receiving action or where's the action being directed or what's the source of the action. Okay. All right, so learn the collocations, then you want to practice them, and that's what we're going to be doing in the last um, part of our live stream today. I do have a full playlist on prepositions. You can check that out. Just look for my playlist. If it's difficult to navigate on YouTube, just hop on over to my website, look under YouTube videos, and you'll see all my playlists organized there. I also have some free practice if you're on a PC. The exercises work best on a computer. They're too small for a phone. I apologize. Okay, but um, I will include this. Actually, I'll put this here. Let me see if I can go boop, 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 boop. That's not going to work. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. Let's hop on over here and here. Oopsies. How's that? Okay. All right, come back in here. All right, so we have a short exercise. I'm going to scroll out a little bit, actually a little bit down so that everything fits on here. And make sure my screen does not block everything. Now I need to go a little smaller for you. Okay, how's that? Okay, eight sentences, I'll, I'll pause for a little bit so you can work on them and then we'll correct them together. Um, these are collocations you should know, right? So for example, number one, do you pay attention at your surroundings or pay attention to your surroundings? If you ask any American English or Canadian English or British English speaker, pay attention, 
they know they know which preposition goes in because it's a collocation it's a combination that we've used hundreds of times so it's automatic it's the standard so you want to learn collocations with prepositions attention is often followed by one of these prepositions which one Mm -hmm. Very good, guys. Pay attention to. Pay attention to your surroundings. And I'll pause. You guys can move on. And to address um, a comment, Stunning Lad 1 is focusing on the noun intervention, um, what preposition follows. And again, sometimes more than one preposition can follow. You can have intervention by someone. Who is the agent? Who is the person doing the intervention? Right? Invention um, by doctors, for example. Looking at a dictionary, Merriam-Webster right now, I see one of their examples is surgical interventions for cardiovascular disease. So that's not naming the agent, it's naming the purpose or the context in which inter intervention is needed. Okay, super. Mahipa, let's check your answers. My grandfather will retire from, yes, you retire from a job. Why? After working for 40 years, right? When you name the length of time, we use for. Since would be like since what? Like the 1990s, for example, or the 1980s. The 80s would be 40 years, right? <laughs> okay. Number three, yes, this is a set phrase. Are you by any chance related to Joe Mitchell? You look a lot like him by any chance, right? By any chance, just like, do, do you happen to be related? Is there a chance that you're related to them? Are you by any chance related to so-and-so? You guys look so much alike, right? Oh, you are related by any chance. So again, what are we highlighting here? Pay attention to. It could be pay attention with or without. Most What's most important here is um, attention to because you can pay attention give attention attention to something retire from a job a company an industry work for how long well, that's just you need to know four goes with years right by any chance that's a set phrase you need to learn it number four exactly very good mahipo you on a rule object to something if you're against it, you object to it. She didn't, and there's a contraction, by the way, didn't, but, um, but didn't object. I'm going to link it to the O. She didn't object to the new office policies because she believed they were necessary. And we can come back to intervention if we have a moment towards the end. How about... Five, six, seven, eight. Four, very good. Ah, okay, so look, five and seven both use apply, and they each use a different preposition, so you need to be careful. This one names the place. This one names what the person wants, the purpose, okay? Here, you complete an application and then you submit it, you send it, you give it. Where do you give it? That's direction. So you can apply to schools, you can apply to programs, 
So apply to schools because you want to get in. You send your application to them. I applied to several business schools. I hope to get accepted. You get accepted where? We use two, right? You can study at a university after you get accepted there. You get accepted, and this is direction. So um, we can say the young man um, was accepted to Harvard. He was accepted to MIT because he applied to several places, and he was accepted to MIT. So that's where he's going, okay? Accepted to. He was accepted to Harvard. My parents approve of, very good, approve of my decision approve of. Now here, number seven, this is purpose. Why are you applying? What do you need? What is your purpose for applying? And I just gave it to you. You apply for a document. So you apply for a visa, you apply for a driver's license, you apply for a permit. Okay, this is the institution you are applying to. This is what you are applying for. So there could be more than one preposition that goes with a verb or a noun. It depends, like intervention. And number eight, after years of dedication, she decided to resign. And it's similar to retire, if you remember. Yes, very good. Resign from. Resign, retire, quit, they're all similar, right? Well, quit, I, I take it back. You, you quit plus an object, quit a job, but you retire from a job, you resign from a position because it's leaving, right? You're leaving the source, you're leaving that um, point. So pay attention to, retire from, by any chance, object to, apply to, accept to, get accepted. Let me put that as part of the collocation. That's a passive construction. Um, students get accepted to certain schools. Approve of, apply for a document. Resign from, okay? Members, I'm gonna give you some more practice on the community tab later, so I'll leave that for you. Um, I'm gonna pause right there just for a moment because I wanna satisfy the curiosity of Stunning Lad 1, intervention of intervention of. Um, there are a number of sources that you can turn to. Um, let's go over here. Uh, let's do Ngram. This is one of many sources you could use. Intervention. Intervention, you're saying, of intervention, by intervention, from. You can go up to at least, I think, at least three phrases. Now watch. See people have written. Intervention of seems to be most common. Okay, so this is an interesting resource to see in publications what um, combination have most writers used. And by seems to be favored over from. Okay, just something to think about. So and this is um, and the books and Graham viewer, you can see um, patterns in publications. Okay, Final exercise, I'm going to end with this, is you're going to listen as I read this text and identify collocations with prepositions. I encourage you not just to watch videos. Yes, you want to watch, you want to enjoy and learn that way, but also make time to read because reading is a different form of exposure. You want, you want to see words and read sentences and think about how, they're, how they're, have, they've been structured. And seeing the language also helps you retain certain patterns. Um, there's reading silently, there's reading aloud, but reading is exposure that's also necessary to build and strengthen vocabulary and grammar. So we're going to do a little bit of that right now. It's our final task. Um, I'll read about Halloween, and you are going to identify collocations with prepositions. If you think you've spotted one, you can put it in the chat. Okay, let me take a sip of tea, and I'll read. Carving pumpkins has become a yearly habit of mine, though I can't claim to be an authority on this art form. I occasionally have trouble with the more intricate designs. 
Nevertheless, I'm proud of my pumpkin carving skills. It's a fun Halloween tradition, and I'm always content with the results. Plus, it hints at the exciting night of trick-or-treating ahead. Are you fond of pumpkins, or at least pumpkin treats like pumpkin bread and pumpkin pie? Remember, carving is cutting, so these pumpkins have been carved. They've been cut and designed for Halloween. And again, if, if you choose a collocation or if you choose a combination that's not a standard collocation, you still might be understood. Um, as you see, some writers did say intervention from, so you're not wrong. It's just um, a, a lesser used combination, right? Why we're learning collocations? Because these are the standard combinations. These are the ones that are familiar to most readers and listeners. So if you use the collocations, um, it's going to sound more natural and you'll have um, more effective communication in general. So you want to learn the collocations, how words combine in natural standard ways. Okay, Has become a yearly habit of mine. This is an example of a collocation. A habit of, I don't know, a habit of, yes, it's not just habit of mine. I take this back. This is not the best example. Um, this was also ChatGPT inspired. I, I doctored it up. I, ch I changed it a little bit. But habit of is not necessarily with a possessive, um, like habit of mine, habit of his. Could also be a habit of doing something. Like I have the habit of um, eating Halloween candy all the way to December. <laughs> right? The habit of doing something. Authority on another collocation. He's an authority on grammar. She's an authority on pumpkin carving. Do you spot any others? We're going to wind down. We're seven minutes past the hour. <laughs> Uh, claim, this is, you, you, this is good. You, this is not a preposition though. Um, that's infinitive, right? Claim to be, claim to do, claim to have, but I'm glad that that caught your attention. You do need to know that claim is followed by an infinitive, but this is an infinitive, not a preposition. Yes, you spotted trouble with, right? You can have trouble with something. Um, content with, you also caught, very good. What about this one? Proud of, right? Couple more. You can hint at something. Right? You're hinting at what you really want. You're not saying what you want. Maybe you're telling your... Um, significant other that you'd really like a necklace for your next birthday like oh i like these necklaces but i really want something a little different maybe in the future i'll have a different necklace you hint 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 at what you want <laughs> hints at very good fond of there's one more there we go i think we caught most of them yep you could do a night of fun, night of partying, night of trick-or-treating. You could see that. A night of what? You could do that. Okay. So we want to pay attention to how prepositions are used, how they um, often follow certain nouns, right? Like habit or trouble, certain adjectives like proud and content, right? Or some um, verbs like hint at something. Okay. All right. We're going to be ending there. Um, Reminder, members, please check the community tab for your follow-up tasks, okay? That will be posted later today. Um, I haven't been seeing other questions. Oh, but I do see a super sticker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that very much. Um, Thank you to the members who participated. Thank you to members who are watching the recording. I appreciate it. Um, also, thank you to the kind-hearted patrons on Patreon. I appreciate your support as well. Every month I have um, 
kind-hearted patrons who are supporting my channel and that's much much appreciated thank you very much okay um don't forget um yeah actually a few people heard this announcement on instagram but i will be making more announcements because in november i will have a special live event um, for um, those who'd like to discuss some of the main themes from the book that i wrote so watch out for announcements and i'll share details on how you can participate it's going to be a free event um, but there is a way to gain an invitation so i'll be sharing details soon okay all right so reminders um, that there's this event coming up in november members um, please check the community tab okay um, and then you'll have your follow-up tasks Patreon is still a place where you can gain lots of practice this month, including live group classes with me on the 13th and 27th. So thank you, thank you for taking the time to study with me. We're at 11 minutes past the hour, time to wind down, okay? Thank you for the participation, guys, and I'll see you again um, the first Friday of November for our next live stream. Thank you, everyone. Take care.